Apple new Dr. Phil. His family claims he's challenging. Get out. Don't touch me. Destroying doors, breaking car windows, and kicking walls. Misunderstood. So you weren't really talking about blowing up the bus? No. And who's to blame? He shoved me. How could he shove you into it if you weren't in there? I was in there. You just said you weren't. For his behavior. He's caught in the crossfire of all of these adults going back and forth and fighting. Plus. I don't think people have affairs for sexual reasons. I think they have affairs because... A Grammy nominee. Why would I step foot on the stage in front of 40,000 people? That's when it would hit my mind. If he only knew. A devastating secret. So you felt like a fraud the whole time. I felt like an imposter. Her inspiring story. It doesn't take as long to heal as it took to get hurt. Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Every parent knows getting your children ready for school on time can be a struggle. But what if you face this in the morning? I need to go to school. I said stop. Get out. Because you were just attacking me. Get out. Don't touch me. Don't touch. Ow. Well, that's what Vanessa and her boyfriend Alex say they've been going through for years with 14-year-old Michael. Now, Vanessa wrote in desperate for my help because she says her son goes, quote, off his rocker anytime he's told no. Destroying doors, breaking car windows, kicking walls, and even ripping sheetrock off the walls. She says she wants her baby back. But her son has been explosive, unpredictable, and out of control since his father's suicide in 2019. I'm sleeping, you My 14-year-old son, Michael, is pretty much terrorizing our life and our family. You move. What the was wrong with you? Move, pervert. I am a prisoner in my own home. When you, just, when you attack me... I'm not attacking you. You are. You don't don't touch me. It has gotten physical to a point where he's taken swings at me in the past. Do not hit me again. Stop! He is very hostile and aggressive towards me. I'm gonna break everything. He physically comes after me. Are you f kidding me? You literally just threw this stick at me in my car. Could be something so simple as just repeatedly hitting me with a pillow. Get out! You need to go to school. I said stop. Stop it! I am becoming more and more afraid of Michael. When I came into Michael's life, he was four years old. I never tried to be his dad. The last two years have gotten really bad. He's punched multiple holes in the wall. He does call me names. I am a badass, a bitch. If I ask him to clean his room, he'll tell me I'm not cleaning my room. At the beginning of Michael's life, his father, Bryant, was not involved. When Michael was nine years old, his dad petitioned the court for custody. So at that time, Michael did not have a relationship with his dad. Michael's father told Michael he could threaten us with CPS. It's not right at all. About a year and a half ago, Michael's dad committed suicide, and that destroyed Michael's life. That is when the anger and the physical aggression started to come out in Michael. Don't touch me. Don't touch. Ow! We have called 911 for safety reasons and sent him to the hospital. I feel like I've lost total control of the situation. Ow! OK, pretty chaotic. Yes, it's extremely chaotic. What do you think your primary mission is as a mother? Uh, right now, my primary mission is to pretty much make sure that I don't have to see my child six feet in the ground or behind a glass window. 
So you're doing damage control. Yeah, we're trying to, um, pretty much we're on the road of um, just trying to survive. We're pretty much walking on glass and it's mm -hmm. cracking and pretty much almost falling out from underneath us. Alex, you've been in uh, Michael's life since he was four or five, right? Yes. But are there times where you do connect with him? It hasn't been in a long time. Long time. He was pretty much made to believe that Alex is a bad person, and no matter what, he shouldn't have anything to do with him. When we talk about his behavior, most of it is pretty aggressive behavior. Uh, he was kicked off the hockey team for hitting another kid in the nose, right? Yes. Uh, he's hit you in the face. He's done ten to $15,000 worth of damage in the house. We're talking about holes in walls, tearing off uh, sheetrock, breaking doors, things of that nature. He's locked his grandfather out, grabbed a knife during an argument. He screams, hits the dog. I looked at his most recent report card, and uh, he had all Fs. Yes. I mean, across the board in, in all of his classes. When we were interviewing him on the phone, uh, he cursed 29 times. So a lot of it is just uh, kind of poor impulse control and just kind of doing what he wants to do. And there's a lot of anger and frustration there, right? You, you made the comment of he wants to do what he wants to do. That's yeah. a lot of it. Trigger points are because of that. We tell uh, well, him to clean his room or you need to get up and go to school. It then becomes an argument because I don't want to go to school today. Yeah. And I'm yeah. not going to have to. And I'm going to fight you all the way to the end of it. Well, let me be very clear about a couple of things here. Uh, I, I'm not here to throw you under the bus as, as a parent, either, either one of you. You have to look at intentions. I, I think you have good intentions here. I don't think you're even being um, reckless. Uh, sometimes people can do bad things on purpose or they can just be so reckless that it's almost like they're doing it on purpose. Y you guys aren't being reckless. Listen, when you see this kind of behavior, you can bet he's miserable inside. Oh, he's very miserable. Well, you he's just know he's unhappy. miserable inside. Would... This isn't the way a child wants to live. So we want to get him out of this as well. We mm -hmm. want to get you guys some peace, get him out of this. We just want a hush to fall over this, this home in, in a positive sort of way. So just know that's my objective as we go into this. Now, we'll meet Michael right after the break. I usually only get mad around my mom. She starts pushing my buttons and then starts recording, so. Don't read the phone. Don't. I don't want to be either too. She's trying to get me in trouble. I enjoy living with my dad more than my mom. And later, three-time Grammy-nominated recording artist Michelle Pilar reveals secrets she has kept hidden for years. I was 17. Me and this guy had been together about three months when I became pregnant. I found myself sitting in an abortion clinic, and I can still remember the cracked linoleum floor and the dingy walls and being scared to death. Tomorrow... She claims her mother, Teresa. Let's take a look at the message you sent. I wish Maxwell had survived and you died. Is no Mother Teresa. This moment for my son was away. not about you. You all have failed to understand at some point it is about me. I no. felt as though. No, no gratitude. Okay, stop. I'm going to ask you to leave the stage if you can't control yourself. That's tomorrow. Then on Monday, the organizer of a social media festival flop. Michael says he was falsely branded a scammer. I'm here to get healing for myself. It has nothing to do with the fact that you're trying to do another Tanacon. That's Monday. I would say I am Michael's biggest trigger at the moment. Stop it! Move! I told you to leave my room. Me asking him to do something just upsets him. Can you move? What the f was wrong with you? Move, pervert. Move! <laughs> Redneck bitch. Life in my home is extremely chaotic and unpredictable. You were just a few years older than him I when was, you had him. I was only um, 17 when I gave birth to him. So we had a child having a child. Yep. And then a few years later, you, you had another child. Yep. 
had a And then many him. years later, you, you've had a third child. Yep. So you've had three children, three different fathers. Yep. One of them has taken his own life and is out of the picture. Yes. So there's been a lot of personalities in Michael's life, is what I'm saying. There has been a and lot of different. We, now, let's take a look at what Michael has to say. I usually only get mad around my mom. Single my mom just likes to push my buttons. Sakes, get out! Don't! She starts fights. Don't! No! No! I've gotten mad to the point where I blacked out and I do rational things. Don't! She should not be afraid of me. Um, I've never heard her. Most of the time, she harasses me. She starts pushing my buttons and then starts recording, so. Don't read the phone. Don't. I don't want to be videotaped. No. Be because I'm showing your grandma. She's trying to get me in trouble. My mother overreacts over the tiniest situations. It's really confusing, and it is overdramatic. Right here. I've been a little depressed and not really happy ever since my dad passed away, and it's been going a little bit downhill ever since then. I'm not really angry at anyone. I can just get really frustrated sometimes. I enjoyed living with my dad more than my mom because I had a little bit more freedom. Me and my dad, we never really fought. And I was much healthier with my dad. My mom feeds me a lot of fast food. I want a better relationship with my mom. Good to meet you. Um, it's good to meet you too. Would you agree that when you have a family, everybody in the family has a certain role that they're supposed to play? Like, you have a little sister that's 18 months old, right? Yes. And she has a role, and her role right now is to be a baby. What's your role? I would say just uh, I My role is just to be a kid. Right. Yeah. Great answer, by the way, because I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And at 14, what's a kid supposed to be doing, generally speaking? going to school and having a social life. In, in a family unit, is there supposed to be somebody in charge? Um, yes. Somebody that runs things? Is that your mom's role? Yes. OK, so she's supposed to be in charge. Yeah. Uh, does that mean that you and your brother and ultimately your little sister um, are to be supportive of the leader? Yeah. Are you? Um, most of the time, yes. And you said one of your roles is to go to school. Yeah. Are you? Yes. How are you doing? I'm doing actually for, um, very well. Really? Because here are some notes from your school. Refusal to work, made comments about blowing up the bus while on it. That seems pretty antagonistic to folding into the school scene. I was like, I was not the only one doing this. I was, we were all talking about this game that we were doing. So you weren't really talking about blowing up the bus? No. All right, let's take a look at a typical argument between Michael and his mom. And pay particular attention to how this escalates very quickly, because there are some lessons in this. You guys watch this too. You're seeing yourself maybe for the first time on big screen here. So both of you watch this closely. I can just wait until they're here. You need to go home. Oh, this is my room now. Move. I mean, this is my room. Remember, you want to Move. break all my shit and do that. Move. You opened the garage doors and the doors. Move. No, but you want to go in my room and just throw everything. Why should I not? I'm not. Move. Scan your life. Move. Don't. You really want to open the door? Stop it. Move. I told you to leave my room. You it took opened. an hour. In an hour, and you were sitting on the floor, move. laying on it and in my closet, and touched my dirty ass underwear. Can you move? What the f was wrong with you? Move, pervert. Move. No, you're. I had in the room. Move. You're a bitch. <coughs> move. I just want the garage door shut. Okay, I'll go shut the garage door, and then you can go stay in the room. Don't tell me what to do. Move. Oh shit! Throw me down the stairs right here. Move. Push me. Okay, Michael, you found that hard to watch. Why? Usually when this happens, when my mom records something like that, 
It's usually right after, like, she provokes me. Like, I send the video. She sat in my room for, like, two, one hour and just sitting in there yelling, screaming, and throwing all my stuff everywhere. Like, I just got a new dresser, and she just threw, like, a bo the, we have a dog's dish for water. She just threw it all over my bed and my dresser, and actually it's moldy, if you don't remember. Um, no. Well, hang on a second. Now, I, I want an honest response here. Seriously. Is that true? Had you been in combat with him preceding that video? When um, events like that happen, it's... No, no, I'm not asking about events like that. I'm asking about that specific event, and it's not an essay question. That's a yes or no. You either were in there, no. there was a pre-fight to this fight, or there wasn't. No. So he's just totally lying. I would say yes. He is Well, I just don't believe lying. that. Because in the argument, he's saying, you were just in my room throwing my things around, and you didn't dispute that on the video. Actually, when he refers to the dresser breaking, it was that he shoved me into it and then everything fell with it. But how could he shove you into it if you weren't in there? I was in there. You just said you weren't. Well, I was in there, but I was not in there provoking him. Uh, coming up, Alex says that Michael has done ten to $15,000 worth of damage to the house and that he's also wreaked havoc at his aunt's house. Well, we'll talk about that and meet the end. We come back. Michael's a very hard child to parent. Michael has called me all kinds of vulgar names, worn at me. I had a lot of damage done with inside my house from him. The more you engage with Michael, the meaner he gets.
with non-stop drama. My daughter, Melissa, is a mean, raging alcoholic. Falling down the stairs, laying unconscious in the snow. All month long. What do you do all day? I drink. On Dr. Phil. I'm so worried about her dying. You're killing her. Real people. Alexandria has gone to the emergency room 600 times. Sometimes it can be like three, four times a week. Real problems. You've been fired from four jobs because you just walked out and went to the hospital? Yeah. You got off a plane because you thought you were having appendicitis. If I don't go to the hospital, something is going to happen to me. Dr. Phil May. Michael does not respect me. He says things like, you're not my real dad, I don't have to listen to you. He's called me worthless, fat, lazy, ass <laughs> you name it, he's pretty much called me it. I do not think Michael respects me at all. I feel like I've lost total control of this situation. Colleen, Michael's great aunt, and Christopher, his grandfather, have both been caught in the crossfire of these disputes. Here's what the aunt and the grandfather have to say. Michael and Vanessa fight constantly. Move! You're a redneck And it doesn't matter what it is about. Michael's a very hard child to parent. There are times that Michael has no control over his anger and his actions. Michael and I have gotten into some battles when Michael and Vanessa lived at my house. Michael has called me all kinds of vulgar names, sworn at me that I was worthless as an aunt. He has exhibited the anger towards me in physical, verbal, and emotional ways. I had a lot of damage done with inside my house from him. The more you engage with Michael, the louder, the more destructive, the meaner he gets. Oh, Michael's my first grandson. And to see him not care about how he attacks me, how he tries to get me to punch him, that's not right. Michael has the tendency to exaggerate the truth. Michael has gone to school and told his teachers that Vanessa or Alex are abusing him, which is not true. I don't understand or know where he gets these lies. I want the grandson that doesn't want to provoke me into attacking him I want my grandson that doesn't use language to tell me that I'm worthless. I want that grandson back. What's y'all's theory about why Michael's on this path? Honestly, I don't think he knows why he's on this path. I think that through actions outside of his own, people have given him examples. I'll use um, the custody battle to where the father belittled the mother and the mother wasn't worth anything. And he's just taken that same step to where, just like his father said, she isn't worth anything. She, you don't have to listen to her. He's now uses that. Can I say? Please. Um, they said that my father mistreated my mother. And I would say that's true. But also, my mother did the same thing to my father. They both. He got really heated over what my mom would hide. My mom would not let me out of the house when it was my dad's day to have me, and my dad would do this. Well, my dad wouldn't do the same thing. I don't actually disagree with that very much because I made sure, as a parent that was not allowed to see his daughter, that I would never let my daughter hide you ever from him. I know you've been told that from your father. We never, and I would never allow that. So please give. But there was the animosity there. between these two. I would say that there was a little bit of confrontation, and I feel like it always came off that I felt like I was trying to defend myself from a story. When I when I would go with Vanessa and pick Michael up, um, we couldn't go in his father's driveway. We had to sit out away. They would literally call the cops and try yep. to have you arrested for trespassing. Yes, you, you know you did. You would come up to my grandparents and you would yell, swear, and so would my mother, and so would my other grandfather. No. The end result is still that he's caught in the crossfire of that. all of these adults going back and forth and fighting. And what do you expect to happen when we ride on the slate of who these children are? Coming up, Colleen says Michael has uh, lied about her smoking marijuana when she was just having a cigarette and calls Vanessa an alcoholic. Uh, sometimes when she's not even having a single drink. 
So is Michael lying today? I have some things I want him to look at after the break. Anything in a country mile of this conversation that either of you are characterizing is so inappropriate to have between a mother and child. It is so off the chart. It is so... Well, the reason why we're... There is no reason. Fill in the Blanks is back with all new shows that will provide you with the information you need to fill in the blanks in your life. I'm hosting top experts in brain health and behavioral science, the best women and children's advocates and visionaries who share their experience, strength, and hope with the important topics, including how to help children navigate the new normal and how to understand human behavior. An all-new season of Fill in the Blanks starts May 25th, available on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Michael does use a lot of bad language. Hit me in the face and go yourself. I would say that he swears regularly and uses the word and the B word. You're a redneck. I do use curse words, but I learned it from my mom. I do use foul language now in front of him. I am not setting a good example for him when I do that. You know, Michael, I, I ask you what your role was. And you said, uh, my role is to be a kid and to get an education and have a social life. And you're really exactly right about that. You know, Robin and I raised two boys, uh, Jay and Jordan. And I, I, I told my boys growing up, you've got two jobs. Uh, one is to get an education. And two is to have a damn good time doing it. Your job, Michael, is to get an education and, and have a good time. And you're not having a good time. And this is happening in a situation where you're miserable and you're making everybody else miserable because things have happened. I mean, to lose I don't is... think he actually understands that he is making it that miserable because when he does this, he tends to black out and not be there. Well... I think that may be pretty spot on. These are some quotes from you. You said, I feel out of control when I get angry. I go into a black rage. And then you said, I get amused by antagonizing and adding fuel to the fire. I usually do it for fun. Yeah, I said that. I. And I would explain it as like if you're watching like the Joker movie, like he's sitting there and he's looking at you and then his Joker face comes on and he'll be like, ha, 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 and you just sit there and he's gone. Could you I, recall doing that? I remember this very, very well. Um, she would come downstairs, she would turn on the light and she would come downstairs, yell at me and antagonize me, saying jokes about my dad, saying how, oh, your dad's a piece of and you're and you're ugly like him. You and you're just a you're just a piece of you, go, you should go kill yourself. And that's what she would come downstairs and say to me. Is he right that you say these things to him? I told him once that I believe that his dad truly loved him and he did not hate me as much as he thinks he did. Because I said that there was only a few hours from the time that his dad died to the time that I picked him up from his house and he was the last person with him. So I said, I am very glad that your dad did not kill you. I have never said that I think he could or he should. It's more of that when I say something, he takes it out of context and changes the words. Okay, can I say something? She would say, hey, I, you're not worth going to jail. I wouldn't kill you. Why don't you go kill yourself or I don't have to go to jail and pay a bail bond and that your dad, and then you're lucky that your dad did not kill you, because he did hate you, and he and he didn't hate me, and I was a miserable child. Are you saying you haven't of. had that conversation with him? I have never had that conversation, that I recall. Well, anything in a country mile of this conversation that either of you are characterizing is so inappropriate. I agree. To have between a mother and child. It is so off the chart. It is so... 
Well, the reason why we're... There is no reason. So can I give a few examples? We'll be things? right back. Awesome. There are times that my children have seen me argue with Michael. We are not successful at shielding them from the confrontation. My two-year-old is seeing a life or death battle with my 14-year-old son, and she's extremely scared. Don't touch me. Why is your phone No. <laughs> Go. Now. I am extremely nervous that I'm failing as a mother. Michael, I, I want to appeal to your greed. I want to appeal to your greed, because I, I think we talked about roles, and I think there are roles in life, too. We go through phases, and one thing I know about teenagers is they want what they want when they want it, and they want it right now, um, and that's okay. That kind of comes with the territory. And I, I want to appeal to your greed, because I want you to know what you want, and greedily go after getting it. I'm asking you to be your own best friend. And you're not being your own best friend here. You have four people sitting here that love you greatly. You've got four people here that love you enough to stop their lives and drive all the way across the United States to come down here and sit here for you. And I can't tell you how many teens I deal with that just don't have that kind of commitment around them. And I thank them for that. So many kids don't have people in their corner, but you do. And you, you have had some frustrations in life, and I'm sorry for that. But the question is, what are you going to do about it now? And you're old enough now that your decisions start affecting you. What you do in school affects you because you're going to be selling those skills to the world. And this is all going to determine what kind of quality of life you have. And can your mother learn to be a better partner parent? Sure. But you need to be a good upstream manager and be a better partner son, a better role model for your brother. And... It's time for you guys to decide, let's do this together. Now, I, I want to introduce someone to this situation that I would really like to introduce as a representative of an intervention team that I want to bring in here to work with you guys when you leave here. I want to introduce Aaron Pash. Now, Aaron is the co-founder of Ellie Family Services, uh, she's a marriage and family therapist, and she is considered an expert in relationships. So she's joining us now virtually. Erin, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Dr. Phil. Hello, everyone. Erin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, talk to us about what you guys envision uh, from, uh, from Ellie and everything that you have in mind here. Uh, at Ellie, what makes us really unique is our creative approach to working with complex family dynamics. So what we will plan to do is create a team of people who can both help address individual traumas that are contributing to the chaos um, and make sure that everybody feels like they're getting individual support in the process of working through some of this uh, really deep family stuff. Well, Erin, that makes perfect sense. And you know, kids this age should be full of joy. The house should be full of joy. And, if everybody can lean into this and work at it together, I think you're on the cusp of some major changes here. And I think you're willing to do that, right? You want to do that. Yes. Is this something that you're willing to lean into and take this help? I am willing to take any help that I can get. Christopher, what do you think about what we're saying? I hope he buys in because I know we're going to try. And if he'll buy in and follow through and with support, I'd love to be back here in a year or two and show a great success. What he's saying is exactly right. And it's up to you. You choose the life you want. And it's there for the taking. It's there for the taking. And I'm putting my faith and confidence in you, so 
I believe you. in you. Don't let me down. Yeah, and I thank you for that. All right. I became a Christian actually three weeks after my abortion. So you felt like a fraud the whole time, like I'm pretending to be something I'm really not. I felt like an imposter. Trying to outrun the pain. Joining me now is Michelle Pillar, a three-time Grammy-nominated recording artist with more than two million records sold, with fans from not just the United States, but from all over the world. Michelle says she's been recording since the age of 19, but she's actually been singing since five. But behind the glitz and glamour, no one could explain the pain that she endured. Now, today she opens up about her life in her book, Untangled, The Truth Will Set You Free. So please welcome Michelle Pilar. Michelle, thank you so much for being here today. I can't tell you how excited I am to talk about this. Thank you so much, Dr. Phil. It's great to be, and it's great to see you. We'll talk about the book in, in just a minute, but I, I wanna talk about you first as a person. You have had an amazingly storied career, and you have really changed the face of, of Christian music. And the reason that I, I think your story is, is so interesting is because you have had the courage to really open up about the authenticity that's behind your music, which has certainly not been a success-only journey, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it feels good to have enough of the healing um, within you so that, you're, that you are free to tell the truth. Before you're healed, you, you're hiding and you're, you're trying to figure out what to do with it. But once you are healed, telling the truth actually is, is very easy. Well, that's the thing. And I, the reason I think this is so important for people is they look at someone like you that seems so together and you know so radiant and happy in in your life and to hear the story that's behind that people are inspired by that to talk about some of this at at age 17 you had an event in your life from which you carried a lot of shame talk about what that was and how that impacted you when i was 17 i was trying to escape my my childhood home so I started dating a man that was eight years my senior. Me and this guy had been together about three months when I became pregnant. And for me, that was so devastating because my whole goal in life was be, to be the perfect little girl to try to make up for all the mayhem in my, my home that I grew up in. I thought if I could just be perfect enough, I could make up for everybody else's stuff. So what do I do? You know, I'm barely out of high school and Roe versus Wade was 90 days old. And so I found myself sitting in an abortion clinic. And um, I can still remember the cracked linoleum floor and the dingy walls and being scared to death. I was in and out of there so quickly that it was over before I really had time to think about it or have, have choices. And you dealt with a lot of shame from that. You carried that shame for a long time. What was the impact on you? You know, when you have a secret like that, and then all of a sudden I became a Christian, actually three weeks after my abortion is when I, I came to know the Lord. So then all of a sudden, because I could sing, I was catapulted into a recording career. So all of a sudden now I'm on these huge platforms with Billy Graham and, you know, Madison Square Garden. And you know what would happen? Right when I'd step foot on the stage of the Billy Graham Crusades in front of 40,000 people, that's when it would hit my mind, like, if he only knew. So I felt like everywhere I, everywhere I turned, it was always sabotaging me to carry that shame. So you felt like a fraud the whole time, like I'm pretending to be something I'm really not. That's the perfect way to put it. I felt like an imposter. Michelle, coming up, I'm gonna ask you about the fallout from the affair you said almost ruined your life. In fact, almost cost you your life. We'll do that right after the break. Tell me about that darkest moment when you said, okay, there's no point in going on. I was ready to take a handful of pills. I felt 
this presence come into the room, I began having a conversation with the darkness. Want to know what's coming up on Dr. Phil? Visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, live strategies, and exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on DrPhil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. Michelle, you say at age 29, uh, which this was in 1984, you had an affair. You were married, but you had an affair with someone that was also married. That's right. And tell me what impact that had. Well, you know, I don't think people have affairs um, for sexual reasons, if I can be honest. I, I think they have affairs because they've somewhere along the line, they've lost their voice. So you become right. attracted to somebody and all of a sudden they're going to be the fix all end all be all. And you go ahead and jump into the water and you find out, oh my gosh, I'm in the stew. And that's what happened to me. You said that it got so bad for you that it pushed you to the brink of suicide. Absolutely. So tell me about that darkest moment when you said, okay, there's no point in going on. I'd never been suicidal before, but I just felt like my, it'd be just better if I just weren't here. And so I was ready to take a handful of pills, and there I sat. Tell me what pulled you back from the brink. That I was sitting on the same bed I'd hidden under um, as a child to get away from my mother's yardsticks and coat hangers and things when she drank. I felt this presence come into the room that was very dark. I began having a conversation with the darkness. We had it out. And I said to this darkness, I have been running from you all of my life. Just help me do this. He pretty much told me I was right about everything. I was worthless and that it was just best that I take those pills. And I remember putting my face in my hands and crying. And I said to myself, you know, Lord, I, I know you, but I can't find you. In that moment, I literally felt someone sit down on the bed next to me now and i knew exactly who it was it, it was it was jesus why did you decide to lay bare all of your secrets in book form after i had spent about 10 years doing some really hard work going to counseling i really wanted answers and then i was walking through my barn one day and i just felt this something in my belly stir up and I, I was praying and, I, and I, I actually said this, I said, Lord, why do you want me to tell my story? That this voice inside of me said, if you will tell the unvarnished truth about what I've done for you, I'll use your story to get into the story of the, of the reader in places I can't go. So really the, telling the truth was no longer about me, but it was about somehow opening a door for others to not be so afraid. The book that I'm talking about that Michelle wrote is Untangled. Particularly right now, coming out of the pandemic, there are a lot of people feeling tangled up by those pressures. What is your message to those people? I think it's to let people know that it doesn't take as long to heal as it took to get hurt. Many people that I meet are just too afraid to open that can of worms. When you get some good help, and you step into the shoes of courage and God is right there waiting to be with you and to heal you and to listen. I've said many, many times, we generate the results in life we think we deserve. And if you're telling yourself that, that you're, you're just garbage, that you're trash, you don't deserve anything, you'll generate those results in your life. And when you finally claim the right to forgive yourself, then all of a sudden you start generating results that come with that. That's the inspiration that I think people see in your life. The book is Untangled, The Truth Will Set You Free, and God bless you for writing it, and God bless you for coming here to talk about it. Yeah. Michelle, thank you, for, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I would like to thank all of my guests today, including my earlier guest, Vanessa, who wrote to me for help with her raging and violent 14-year-old son, Michael, and a very special thanks to Aaron Pash and all the folks at Ellie Family Services 
for agreeing to help out. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to an all-new season of my podcast, Fill in the Blanks, launching May 25th. We are digging into everything from how to interpret body language to how to understand human behavior. I'm going to speak with leading experts, visionaries, decision makers about the topics that affect you and your life. Another podcast not to miss is Robin's I've Got a Secret. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.